Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. It's not people that are necessarily self-destructive or want to have this type of response. It's an accident based on the fact that these markets are completely unregulated and it's really easy to hurt yourself when there's so much uncertainty, so much basic uncertainty. Various situations, you're in Africa, you're looking for quaaludes and you're kind of hanging out with this guy that is on them and he offers them to you and you're just like, no. You know, the fact that Native Americans are allowed to use peyote in a religious context is a very important legal triumph. I, I believe in experimentation. I believe in exploring the possibilities. And I think as soon as people enter into this very prescriptivist, dogmatic attitude, um, not only does it limit the potential therapeutic scope of these compounds, it uh, makes people more vulnerable. What's up, guys? You are listening to The Human Experience, and wow, what an interesting episode with Mr. Hamilton Morris. Uh, Hamilton is a chemist. He appears on a Vice documentary series called Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia. This interview was incredibly last minute, impromptu. It's, an, it's actually a really, really interesting conversation on the different compounds and his chemistry background, his relationship with Alexander Shuglin. You guys will love, love this conversation if you're into any of that stuff. I highly recommend checking out Hamilton's show, Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia. It's a highly entertaining watch. Thank you guys so much for listening. The Human Experiences in Session, my guest for today is Mr. Hamilton Morris. Hamilton, my good sir, welcome to HXP. Thanks for having me. So Hamilton, uh, I found out about your work through your vice program, Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, but our listeners might not know what that is yet. So what sparked the interest in chemistry? Why is that so fascinating for you? Um, I would say the first person in the psychedelic scene that really interested me was a chemist named Alexander Shulgin. Yes, yes. And he wrote two books, P. Call and T. Call, that I think are absolute masterpieces and are kind of unrivaled in, in terms of psychedelic literature. They right. are really illuminating the scientific texts, but they also say an enormous amount about the history of psychoactive drugs, the botany, the qualitative effects, psychopharmacology. It really has almost everything yes. that you could possibly want in these two books. So Alexander Shulgin was first and foremost a synthetic organic chemist. I think that his technique and his way of thinking about psychoactive drugs is very chemically oriented, and it seemed to me to be the best framework for researching and kind of investigating what was out there. I think that his work exploring completely unknown compounds was incredibly brave and important for our current understanding. Hmm, so okay. that's what really got me. And, and the chemistry is not all that difficult for a lot of these phenethylamine and tryptamine compounds. It's, it's sort of accessible to people that aren't necessarily chemists. You don't need to have like a multi-million dollar lab. You do need to have some training in chemistry and an understanding of the subject, but it's, it's accessible chemistry and, and there's a lot left to be done. So that was what I found interesting is when you read these books, throughout the books, they're full of these little hints, these little clues, like maybe there's some unknown compound that could have really interesting qualitative effects or really interesting pharmacological characteristics. Go forth and investigate it. Yeah, and that's, that's what I love about you. You have this sort of 
highly explorative mind. You go into a subject and you explore it thoroughly. And just jumping into your, your Vice program, when I was watching it, I found it kind of hilarious that you're in these various situations. You're in Africa, you're looking for quaaludes, and you're kind of hanging out with this guy that is on them, and he offers them to you, and you're just like, no. But jumping back to Alexander Shuglin, you got a chance to, to meet him as well, right? Yeah, many times. And, you know, what was, what was he like? Well, when I was going down to the, the Shuggan farm, it was sort of the end of his life and the end of his career. And he wasn't in his prime anymore. But even then, he was kind of a remarkably unpretentious, funny, weird character who, at least when I first met him, was still doing a little bit of synthesis. That was kind of at the end of his career. He was dedicated to exploring these derivatives of the compound 5-methoxy DALT. Mm. Um, so he was making the methyl allyl, the propyl allyl, all these different kind of DALT compounds. And, uh, and that in and of itself was inspiring to me that this person could be um, you know, almost blind, but still dictating the syntheses to an assistant in the lab and still so dedicated to his life's work. You know, the great thing about Shulgin is that he wrote these books, and the books really do an incredible job documenting his work. So even though not everyone has the opportunity to meet him, I truly believe that uh, you can get the impact of that from reading his books. And he's, his lab notebooks were so rigorously kept that you can even further explore his life's work through all of that as well, if you want even more. There's no shortage of material to explore for anyone that's interested in Alexander Shulgin. I've got a copy of both Tikal and Pikal, but they are kind of just library tokens. They just sit there right now. I haven't had a chance to, to crack them open yet. What, oh, what about... You should. Okay, uh, why? Why do you think I should? You know, like there's been a lot of emphasis on the therapeutic qualities of psychedelics, mm -hmm. and I think that's great, increasing a social acceptance and understanding of these compounds. But I'm really interested in just knowing what's out there, hmm. whether it's good or bad, therapeutic or toxic. It doesn't really matter. I'm just curious about like, what exists. And when you look through those books, you see all these compounds that have really remarkable and sort of unexpected qualitative effects that fall outside of this general umbrella of psychedelic. You have compounds like um, 2-methyl-5-MeO-DMT mm -hmm. that seems to maybe have like a aphrodisiac effect or 2-methyl-DMT that seems to have a semi-selective tactile hallucinogenic effect or DIPT, which has a semi-selective auditory distortion effect. And, uh, and even if these things might not have the same therapeutic applications that something like MDMA or psilocybin has, they could be very important and useful tools for studying consciousness and how we perceive the world. Where have you been that was the most remarkable for you? Is there a location that sticks out in your mind the most? I mean, you've, I know you've been around to all around the world to different places to find these psychoactive compounds. Maybe what stood out to me more than anything was actually this now defunct laboratory that was in New Zealand operated by a, a widely disliked synthetic cannabinoid baron named Matt Bowden, who I think is a really amazing guy. Mm. Um, there, was, there was kind of a, a, an odd thing that happened in New Zealand a, a few years ago where, for whatever reason, the social stand of cannabis was such that it was totally inconceivable that cannabis could ever be made legal in New Zealand. There, every drug policy expert, every politician that I spoke with wouldn't even consider the possibility of cannabis being made legal. Yet they were incredibly open-minded about the possibility that a synthetic cannabinoid could be developed under a sort of semi-pharmaceutical standard where there would be like a, almost like a clinical trial, but for a recreational drug. Mm -hmm. And they were willing to allow this to happen, to allow the construction of what was essentially a pharmaceutical company for recreational drugs in New Zealand. And that was called Stargate International. And it was run by this guy, Matt Bowden. And that was uh, such a revolutionary thing. I don't think people fully appreciated how extraordinary that was. Um, you know, it was so amazing that as soon as I heard about it, I thought, well, I want to move to New Zealand to work at this company. I want to get involved in the, uh, in the synthesis and the research and development. Mm -hmm. 
because this is a really amazing opportunity to explore psychedelics in a in a capacity where you're able to do rigorous work. You know, they were doing screens for off-target binding. Most of these compounds are cannabinoids, but they would screen them at serotonin receptors and dopamine receptors to see if there's any off-target activity. They'd look for hepatotoxicity, kidney toxicity. They were doing a lot of, you know, semi-rigorous work. And the data that they collected was really impressive. And so going to that lab and seeing this kind of futuristic taste of what it could be like Hmm. in a world where this sort of research was sanctioned Mm, by the government, where people had the freedom to explore whatever they wanted to optimize the qualitative effects of these psychoactive compounds. It was really inspiring. And I, I really liked Matt Bowden a lot and really liked the pharmacologist that he worked with. I thought they were both kind of brilliant people, um, even though synthetic cannabinoids are so stigmatized at the moment that people have a lot of difficulty even acknowledging the possibility that what they were doing could have been a good thing. There seems to be this resurgence of psychedelic usage and the research that's coming out on psychedelics and the positive impact that LSD, MDMA, ayahuasca can have on the brain. What's your stance on this, and how do you see the policies changing over time? I think it's all great research. It's not the work that I find most compelling, but I think it's necessary, and I'm very happy that it's happening. You know, I was at the recent psychedelic science conference Mm -hmm. in Oakland, Mm -hmm. and there's a huge emphasis on clinically relevant work with these things, MDMA for PTSD, psilocybin for addiction, treatments for depression. From a PR perspective, it's really brilliant because, you know, all this stuff looks good. Then it's much more likely that they're accepted and you're helping people. So that's all that's all great work to be done. It's just not I'm a little bit more interested in the basic science and the chemistry. And I always find it a little bit ironic that when you go to these conferences, you know, the two most important figures in the psychedelic community, the two biggest names, Albert Hoffman and Alexander Shulgin, Mm -hmm. they're both synthetic organic chemists. And yet, at these conferences, there will not be a single presentation on chemistry, not a single one. It's all clinical. It's all therapeutic. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the the one thing that I wish that people would have a little bit more appreciation for the basic science, for the pharmacology, for the chemistry, for the people that are constructing new compounds. Because as wonderful as evolution is and has been for designing or creating these compounds like mescaline and psilocybin, I think that strategic modification, some of their therapeutic qualities could be further improved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I really like that. You've been around to these different places. What is your take on the shamanistic aspect of things? You said in the pre-show we were talking about you're taking a trip to Peru to study an aspect of this. What's your take on the different types of shamanism around the world? A lot of these shamanic practices, I believe, are widely misunderstood by people. I think one thing especially that people often don't appreciate is how Christian a lot of these practices are. You know, a lot of the mushroom and salvia shamanism in Mexico is very much oriented toward the worship of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is something that most people don't want to think about because they would prefer to imagine these things as these kind of like uncontaminated ahistoric lineages that stem from the original religious impulse and have no association with the conquest or industrialized society. But when you really get down to it, there's a lot of syncretism, there's a lot of hybridization of beliefs, and a lot of these things are a lot newer than people would want to admit. You know, the the Native American church in the United States is a very good institution you know, the fact that Native Americans are allowed to use peyote in a religious context is a very important legal triumph. Mm -hmm. But um, it was only probably a very small minority of Native American tribes in the United States who actually have a long history of use of peyote. And that would be, you know, the tribes that were located sort of in the southern Texas region. This was certainly not something that extended toward the, the northern parts of this country. You know, what would you say is a compound that has the most exotic effects? I mean, something bizarre or strange that you wouldn't find with other compounds. There are a lot of compounds with really unusual effects. Some of these synthetic cannabinoids, one, I believe, AM3344, causes either 
instantaneous deafness after it's smoked oh my gosh. that that is reversible it lasts seemingly about 24 hours and then users regain their ability to hear or extreme instantaneous tinnitus so again you know like a lot of these things you think oh that's a bad thing why would anyone use that cannabis is has this established history of safety why would anyone bother with these things and on this level of safety i agree completely it's completely true that these things have no history of human use and the risks are far greater but I think within these superficially bad responses, there's something important that can be discovered. Maybe this could be used in investigation of deafness or tinnitus. Maybe you could use this to create a, an animal model of tinnitus and test drugs that might reverse the effect. And the, you know, the same is true of this drug MPTP, which was a contamination in samples of a synthetic opioid that caused instantaneous Parkinson's disease. Superficially, it was a terrible thing to have happened. And it's kind of the the quintessential synthetic drug scare story. Like, how do you know that this new drug being discovered isn't going to be the next MPTP? How do you know that it's not going to cause instantaneous Parkinson's disease or death? But again, even in the case of this really horrific opioid that caused paralysis and everyone it became a really important method for chemically inducing Parkinson's for testing therapies. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of weird, superficially negative things that are being published in the toxicology literature at the moment. But I think if you take a step back, there's also a lot of really interesting things to be learned from it outside of the, the tragedy that people are uh, forced to use. Yeah. And, um, you know, kind of retouching on the point that you were making earlier about the policy changes and having this sort of unfettered access to synthesize these compounds and do the actual research on them. I mean, which is which is why where the policy is and where the policy stands is so important for me and why we do shows like this one, why we cover the positive effects of ayahuasca, why we cover the positive effects of MDMAs, because, I mean, I don't know if you remember the Just Say No campaign and, of course, yeah. and everything that was with that. And our view of drugs was just so isolated and so propagandized. What's your take on that? I think it's really unfortunate. It's a, it's a really big problem. It's a bigger problem than people even recognize this kind of basic ignorance surrounding psychoactive drugs and, and the way people categorize you know, illegal drugs in one way, pharmaceutical drugs in another way. All these kind of illusory categories that are constructed by the government go a long way to encouraging this distorted and confused view of drugs. That there's something like it's considered like subversive or naughty to use a psychoactive mm -hmm. drug um, in our culture. Like it's like a bad thing. Like, oh, hi, hi, I went out and I drank and did cocaine on Friday night. I was so naughty on Friday. You know, in a lot of cultures, that just doesn't exist. It's, these are just plants. Right. And everyone uses kratom in the south of Thailand that is working on a rubber farm because it gives them energy to harvest rubber at night. You know, that's simply that. It's just a tool. It's like, you know, you know, as I was interviewing them, maybe the most interesting thing about it was how boring it was that this drug has so much cultural baggage. Is it addictive? Is it dangerous? Does it kill people? Is it this? Is it that? And, uh, and then when you talk to people in Thailand about it, it's like interviewing someone about what they think of drinking tea in the morning. They have very little to say about it. Are they addicted to it? Maybe a little. What would happen if it disappeared? They just stopped using it. Not a huge deal. And that's that. Yeah, yeah, I love that perspective, man. Thank you for sharing that. So let's talk about this Vice documentary series that you're on. The first season just finished airing, I think, and you're moving into the second season? That's correct. What's the premise behind this? You just kind of travel around to find these very obscure compounds? Yeah, sometimes compounds. Sometimes it's about characters that I find interesting. You know, the, the drugs often end up being a, a springboard to get into a tangential issue that I find interesting. The season finale in the first season was about two different chemists in the relationship. One is Daryl Lemaire, the other is Casey Hardison. Casey Hardison is a, a legendary LSD chemist. Daryl Lemaire was one of the first people to manufacture MDMA on a large scale in the United States. It's about stories that I find interesting. And I have a lot of creative freedom to explore the things that I want to investigate. Also known as the most interesting job ever. I mean, um, <laughs> we talked about different areas that you've been that have been a little bit obscure. I mean, is there an area in the world that maybe people haven't heard about yet? 
Sure. I mean, did a whole piece in Madagascar for the previous season where I discussed these various um, hallucinogenic fish or these reports of fish that cause hallucinations. That was certainly very exotic, but that was actually an example of a uh, sort of story that I don't believe works all that well for television. You know, there's a, there's a lot of incentive with TV to get results. You want to have positive results and something that comes together cleanly and can sort of tie a bow on it and present it to the viewer as a, as a story that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And the truth is that a lot of genuine investigations, especially scientific investigations, do not have clear answers. A lot of experiments are inconclusive or have negative results. And my attempts to solve this mystery surrounding these hallucinogenic fish, you know, I, I can't say that I succeeded, but it's, it was a portrait of this weird mystery. And on that level, you know, it's good to make people aware of all the things that are still unknown. And maybe the next person who comes along to investigate it will figure it out. Hmm, okay. Has there been a location or situation where you were, I mean, we're talking about drugs here. So, I mean, it, have you been in a, in a dangerous situation where you were maybe scared for your life or in a situation like that? Scared for my life. This is a question that I'm asked a lot. Hmm. And, you know, I, I feel like the, the more interesting response would be that, to say that I'm often scared. But for whatever reason, I, I think I have a kind of high threshold for fear in these situations, simply because it's not a good way to react to any of these things. If you're afraid of people, you're never going to be able to connect with them. You're never going to be able to gain their trust. You're never going to be able to have a genuine interaction with them. So I try not to think about it that way. I try not to go into a situation thinking, this is sketchy, this is dangerous, I'm at risk. And the truth is, you know, a lot of these people that maybe to a common person would be frightening or, you know, they're technically criminal, so people are afraid of them on that level, but they're very vulnerable people. I mean, they're taking a huge risk talking to me, a much greater risk than I am talking to them. They're people that could be locked in a cage for the rest of their life or cultivating a cactus or doing some type of, in my opinion, completely innocuous work related to psychoactive drugs. Although they are technically criminals in the eyes of the law, and that is frightening to a lot of people, I do not generally find these people all that frightening. Hmm. Okay. There was a piece that you did on Salvia, and it seemed pretty frightening. I mean, I think there was a video of a guy smoking it, and then he, he subsequently jumped out of the nearest window. In your mind, is there a sort of guideline for, you know, people who are exploring this area of, you know, experience and life that, that we should follow when ingesting these compounds, encountering these compounds? Yeah, I mean, I think that at the very least, you want to have a basic understanding of what it is you're consuming, the origin of it, the purity of it, the dose that is being consumed. Um, you know, these are the baseline, most fundamental things that people should know, and yet they don't. They very rarely have this information available when they ingest a psychoactive drug. Oh, sorry. Right. There's a, a child on the window above me doing crazy stuff. Um, it's hard to find a place that on a beautiful day in New York, everyone's out. Um, That's okay. You know, and... And on one hand, you could kind of wag your finger at people and say, you know, you're, you're being so irresponsible for using all of these substances without having any knowledge of the purity or the dose that you're consuming. But what are people supposed to do? You know, we, we live in a society where it's very difficult to have these things tested, even if there are chemists that want to lend their services at, you know, raves or dance parties or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot of legal red tape that makes it difficult to do this sort of analytical chemistry. So it's hard for someone using a street drug to know what it is they're consuming. And that's what's really responsible, I think, for the vast majority of these reported negative responses or toxic reactions to drugs not people that are necessarily self-destructive or want to have this type of response. It's an accident based on the fact that these markets are completely unregulated and it's really easy to hurt yourself when there's so much uncertainty, so much basic uncertainty. 
Mm. I mean, there's always uncertainty. There's enough uncertainty. If you know the exact chemical structure of the compound that you're consuming and you know the purity and you know the exact dose, there's still uncertainty based on set and setting and a number of other factors. There's still uncertainty. But if you remove that as well, I mean, it's, it's surprising that people have as few negative reactions as they do with things like street cocaine, which is routinely contaminated with a drug called levamisole, or street heroin that is now routinely contaminated with fentanyl or derivatives of fentanyl. Um, and then with synthetic cannabinoids, where there's no dosage information and the variety of different compounds that are found in these potpourri type smoking blends that are, you know, it's really staggering in the chemical diversity. It's so interesting, the world that we live in, what we're faced with and, and where we are in our time now, you know, it, it, since sort of starting this show, we get a lot of contacts and we get a lot of emails. The other day, I got an email asking where the best ayahuasca center, where to go drink this tea. And, you know, Western medicine, it's failing. You know, they're seeing that. They're noticing this. And so they're reaching out to these sort of more esoteric psychedelics. Ayahuasca has almost gone mainstream. It's very much in the news and more and more people are finding out about it. Has there been a compound that you've seen that has effects similar to ayahuasca, something like ayahuasca? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a lot of compounds that have similar effects. If you substitute DMT and ayahuasca with MET or DET or DPT, you can experience variations of that same sort of ayahuasca effect, or if you substitute the botanical MAOI with a pharmaceutical MAOI like meclobamide, you can modulate the nature of the effect in that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, these things are endlessly modifiable, which again, I find very interesting. There's a lot of dogma surrounding these substances. A lot of people that say that they should be done a certain way in a certain context. And I am not one of those people. I I believe in experimentation. I believe in exploring the possibilities. And I think as soon as people enter into this very prescriptivist, dogmatic attitude, um, not only does it limit the potential therapeutic scope of these compounds, it uh, makes people more vulnerable. Because you know, what happened with a lot of these ayahuasca retreats in Peru is there was this proliferation of documentaries extolling the virtues of ayahuasca. And a lot of people thought, I want to have this sort of authentic therapeutic experience. I want this transformation. But they felt that the only way to do it was to go to South America. Right. You know, none of these people would ever say, hey, these plants are actually dirt cheap. This is actually a tea that you're all capable of making on your own. Maybe the most valuable context to do this would be within your own community. You don't need to go to the Amazon to have it a transformative experience. Maybe you can have it in your own home. Mm-hmm. So, you know, part of it has to do with the idea that the, the shaman has experience and that they will act as a guide. And I think that's great. I think it's always good to have someone who's experienced and knowledgeable there to, to protect people. But what you started to see in the Amazon is, is a lot of exploitation of the tourist market. Yes. You know, there's, there's been a number of these shamans that are sexual predators. At the very least, you have people overcharging enormous amounts of money for the ayahuasca. It's turned into a business. And as soon as any of these things turn into a business, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for corruption and misuse. Yeah, that's another interesting point I, I think that we're making here. You know, it, it is to be considered that, you know, as the awareness on these topics grows and as more and more people find out about this type of stuff, like the healing properties of these types of compounds, there is an exploitation that happens with these tourists that are traveling down to Peru and dropping, you know, $8,000 to sit with the shaman for, you know, six hours. Is there a personal favorite for yourself? Is there a drug that you are, would be what I would choose? This is what I like the most. You know, I'm I'm much more interested in exploring the unknown than in repeatedly using any known substance. I've, you know, I think a lot of the classic psychedelics are classics for a reason. They really are, you know, fantastic substances. Obviously, LSD, mescaline, psilocybin are all really kind of miraculously good compounds. And we're very lucky that they exist. 
and I think DMT especially is is really fantastic. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of physical discomfort if it can be avoided. I understand that um, there are a lot of traditions that kind of contextualize nausea and vomiting and this bodily discomfort is like a, a, a purging, a metaphorical purging of spiritual disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, if I can avoid that kind of thing, I, I see no reason why it's, it's necessary to suffer in these ceremonies. So that's one reason that I like working with pure compounds is I think that they can allow you to experience all of the positive aspects without being distracted by physical discomfort. You have been listening to The Human Experience. To hear the rest of this episode where we get into Hamilton's adventures and some of the more interesting parts of this conversation, get to thehumanxp.com slash members. By doing this, you allow us to bring on more guests. You allow us to continue the show. If you value even one of our episodes, become a member today. It gives you access to all the members content that we do and it really helps the show out. So thank you guys so much for listening.